Hi everyone, my name is James Feeney. Welcome to or back to my channel. Today I am here with a flip through of a deck that I recently received and some thoughts to offer my thoughts on this deck. So this isn't necessarily, it's not an unboxing, it's not a first impressions, and it's also not a review because I haven't had it long enough to offer in depth, an in-depth analysis on my experience in working with it, but I've had it for a bit and I just thought I would offer my thoughts and also show the cards for anybody who's potentially interested in it. This is the Telluric Tarot by Lunaria, I believe Lunaria Gold. Yes, Lunaria Gold is her name on Etsy, so I'll link the Etsy shop that this is available at below. I know that this creator has made, I believe, two Oracle decks before. Both, one is on, one of the Oracle decks is an Oum deck, so just the cards depicting the Oums, and I believe that there's a crystal accompanying the Oum, so that's how it works, so, and I forget what the other deck is. I don't have either of them, but I've seen them, and they look really great, so those are also available on their Etsy site. They also sell prints, and I just want to take you guys through my thoughts, and also, of course, I'm going to show you the cards. I'll put a timestamp below when the flip-through starts, and when we start talking about the deck, but I just wanted to also offer a few thoughts before we get into that. This was a deck that I had pre-ordered and it took a while to come in and uh, be received and I just thought I would offer the my journey. It feels like I've been on a journey with this deck. So I pre-ordered it in October of 2019 and it was expected to arrive to the, the various people that had pre-ordered it by the end or toward the end of November, I believe it was supposed to arrive on the third or fourth week of November was the estimate. And it continually, there were delays, there were unforeseen uh, hiccups, I guess, in the production of the deck as far as coming in and the quality and the printers. So these are things that I know that the creator doesn't have control over. Still, as somebody who pre-ordered it, and I'm sure others who have either backed decks on Kickstarter or pre-ordered decks before, face some frustration even though you know it's not necessarily the creator's fault these are not things that they could have accounted for and so i don't try to hold that against them the only time i would potentially do that is if i was misinformed or if the creator was maybe behind on the artwork and was telling us that it would be by a certain date and we weren't receiving updates those sorts of things i would be a little bit more critical of the creator in but the actual production and issues arising in that, that's not the creator's fault. So I won't fault her for that at all. I will say it was just, it was a little bit frustrating. It's almost like when you wait so long for a deck and the excitement of expecting it or hoping for it almost starts to wear off to the point where you're just like, maybe I'll get it, maybe I won't. I, I almost don't even care at this point just because I'd waited a bunch of months and then I was almost thinking that it was going to be fully canceled with uh, coronavirus and the global uh, health crisis. I was like, there's no way with already all of these hiccups that it's going to actually come to fruition, but it did and it arrived. And I will say that throughout the process, the updates were a little bit confusing. I had seen, I had been checking in every few months and I also saw that the pre-order went off of Etsy. So I was like, is, is this canceled? Because uh, at first the pre-order option on Etsy was offering the updates in the description and then it was taken off of the shop and I hadn't received an update personally or in a mass email or anything like that and I had to reach out to the creator and I guess that they had missed me on the list of, of people to send updates to. I can only imagine how many there were. And then, uh, yeah, so the updates were kind of sparse but they were really great in saying that they would offer a full refund if somebody wasn't interested anymore in the in the deck and waiting throughout the process. So I'm going to take us over to my tarot table. I will flip through the cards and I will get a little bit more into how this deck works, what it is, and what it's like. So we're going to head over there. Hi everyone. So we're over at my tarot table. We have the box, which contains the book, the deck, the bag. So this is everything that came in the order. And I want to just show you guys a little bit about that before we do the flip through. So it comes in this two-piece hard box, and on the back it has the contact information in the Etsy shop of the creator. So this box is really nice, and inside you get the book. Now the book is really well made, the production of the book is wonderful. There is a, it's a traditional tarot in that there are 78 cards, there is a system to it, so 
the majors would be considered the soul, like the <laughs> within the category of soul. And so then it's also uh, a sort of glossary so you can see where each card is. So it's the combination, each card is the combination of a crystal and a plant and that makes up the, the idea of the card itself. And they were really well chosen. So we have the first suit and the majors, which are the soul suit, or the major arcana is just, yeah, the soul suit. So next we have emotion for the cups. Drive for the wands or fire. Mind for the swords or air. And then domain for the pentacles, discs, earth, what have you. Now I will say it's very, it can be a bit confusing because the cards themselves don't have anything to indicate what suit they're a part of. So for example, uh, Diaspore and Magnolia. Where would I find that? And they're not, they don't, yeah, it's a little bit difficult to see. So it's 13, but because there are courts, the 13 would could be just a court card. So that would mean that there's 14 in each suit. So it could be technically from any suit. So I need to look for the 13th card in all of these suits because the card itself doesn't let you know what suit it's a part of. So that can get really confusing. So it makes it difficult to use as a traditional tarot because Unless you really know the, the mineral or the crystal and the plant combination and how that might feel and intuitively connect to what the artist chose, what like which suit they chose to put it in, you would have to use the book. So I can't look at this and know that it's um, part of the Major Arcana or that it's a court card and what suit it's in. I have to go searching and it's not so intuitive to use the index or the glossary, I should say. So that part of it does make it harder to use as a traditional tarot in my opinion. Although I will say, you do get a nice write-up once you do find it and you go to the page that a given card is on. You get a lot of information, a lot of useful information on the, the mineral and the plant. And in relation, of course, to the card, and then you'll get a reversed meaning for each one, which is nice. So this deck is not in order. I've shuffled it and I attempted to put it in order again for the purposes of this video, but ran into a lot of trouble because, as I said, you don't know... For example, I could look at a card that has the Roman numeral for four on it, and it could be a part of any of these suits, and I would need to look it up and figure out which one is which. So putting it back in order would be really, really difficult, uh, going through the deck and searching each card individually and going through all of the suits to find out where it belongs would be a lot. So it's not in order. I will, I will preface the, the flip through with that, and I think we'll go through maybe one or two entries in the guidebook so that you can see how it all works. Now, this was the hard box it came in. The cards were in the bottom. The book was on the top. I will say I'm not sure if this is something that happened in transit or the way that the box was created, but for example, the cards are not as big as this cutout. And I believe that the intention was to have a cutout that was the size of the cards and that it potentially ripped back on either side as the, as the cards went back and forth. And so that was not, <laughs> that I don't think that was the intention. Uh, the whole entire box came wrapped in plastic and then the deck itself inside of the box came wrapped in plastic. So there wasn't really any damage despite what happened in the internal part. So this is not something I would use to store the deck, especially given the fact that the cutout has, I guess, uh, uh, lengthened itself in transit. I will say when this deck sh shipped out that it did get to me rather quickly. It ships from Canada. I believe that the creator is based out of Canada, if anybody is curious. It also came with this little postcard. I'm not, I forget which card this is. And it just has a thank you and then the information of the creator. It also came with a small bag. It is one of those more like rough plastic bag, so I'm not sure that I'll keep the deck in here long term, but it's nice to have gotten a bag as opposed to have not gotten anything to put the put the cards in, so that was a nice little extra. 
Now, as far as the quality and the deck before we start to flip through the cards, it is gilded and gold, shiny gold. The gilding is actually very nice. And these are the card backs. Very simple and straightforward. I do like them. The card stock is glossier than like a medium, like not a medium finish. It's definitely not matte. And I would say tends on tends to be on the more glossy side. And there's a deck that this reminds me of, and I wish I could think of it for comparison's sake. It's a little bit lighter than you would expect as well. So I'm not really sure what the cardstock is. I do like it, but I can see how this would not be everybody's favorite or everybody's cup of tea, but I don't mind it. I'm not so hung up on cardstock unless it's extremely thin or um, messed up or something, so I do like it. It showcases the art well. It's a traditional tarot size, as far as I can tell, and we will get right into the flip through now. So I do have the first card. The first card is uh, it is bismuth and fern, and it has the infinity symbol, so the only card to have the infinity, or lemniscate at the top.
So those were all of the cards. As you can see, the artwork is stunning. There's this certain, I would say, uplifting quality to the way that they're done. They feel very warm. They feel very inviting. And there's a lot of attention to detail. There's a lot of minerals and stones and plants that we might not normally see. So as opposed to showing us things like very, I would say, mainstream or commonly known minerals and plants, we do get a wide variety of of plants and, and stones and crystals that I personally hadn't thought of or known before this deck. I don't know what Tulsi is, and I've never heard of Pezo, Pezotate? Pezotate and Tulsi are both, <laughs> are both unfamiliar to me, so I guess that this would be great for learning. I will say that I don't think I will be able to use it as a traditional tarot deck or traditional tarot simply because there's nothing to let me know what suit a given uh, mineral and plant is a part of. So I get this three here, Pesitate and Tulsi. I don't know if it is from the Major Arcana and that it is the Empress. I don't know if it's the Three of Wands, the Three of Cups, the Three of Swords, or the Three of Pentacles or Discs. So I would have to go and look in the book, and that detracts a little bit from the ability to just lay down cards and use things as a traditional tarot. So I see myself using this a lot more like an oracle, pulling it and really not paying as much mind to the suit that it's a part of, just because I won't be able to know right away, looking it up in the book and kind of coming to terms with the message through the book and learning about the, the given crystal and plant. So that's how I foresee myself using it. Because there is so much on each one and there's a lot to digest in terms of the book and the image, I think I would probably pull one card at a time. Although, of course, that's just me. I can see this being used in a multitude of ways, but I just wanted to let you all know how I foresee myself using this. So now we'll give it a little bit of a shuffle, lay down a few cards, and I'll pull one up in the book so that you all can see how the book is structured and how an entry might go. So we have Sulfur and Rowan, Hematite Quartz and Pomegranate, and Lodestone and Jewel Weed. Something about the, the Lodestone and Jewel Weed sounds very uh, appealing or it's drawing me in, so I guess we'll find that one in the guidebook and see what it has to say. So it has the Roman numeral 7. We don't know exactly what suit that's going to pertain to, though. So... Okay, it's part of the Major Arcana, so this would be the equivalent to the Chariot, and it's on page 17 and 18. So you get a nice full color, it takes up the entire page, the, the artwork on one side, and then, of course, on this side, you get the write-up. And so for this, we have Lodestone and Jewelweed, Reaching Far and Wide. Lodestone is a naturally magnetized form of magnetite, sensitive to the Earth's own field and, uh, and exercising an attractive force upon iron. The name Lodestone literally means leading stone or journey stone, referring to its use as a compass. Vibrant jewelweed, also named impatience, is, uh, is raring to go. Its pods burst open at the slightest touch in order to eject and spread its seeds more widely. So I have heard of jewelweed, when it's been called in patience. My mom actually grows them in our garden, so now I'm more familiar. The right timing and momentum are in place to make progress or set new things in motion. You have the power to release your own energy into the world and enact necessary changes to move forward. Listen to your inner voice for guidance, yet do not hesitate or restrain your need for movement. This is a time for action, seizing new opportunities, trying different options, and taking a few risks. Then we get the reverse meaning. Certain circumstances are impeding your freedom or progress. It may be tempting to run away from the limiting situation or make hasty decisions. It is safer to plan a while longer and look for options and strategies that will serve you better in the long run. The delay will not last. It is an opportunity to better prepare for the next leg of the journey. So there is a lot of thought put into use the use of the, or the combination, I should say, of the stone and the plant clearly. And... It is really nice to get a little bit of a rundown on these, so if you are interested in nature-based decks, crystal, stone-oriented, and plant, then this would be one for you, I think, to also learn 
about various uh, various qualities or properties, correspondences associated with these. I think it would be nice to potentially even pull a card and then if I say have the stone or have that plant available to me, I might want to interact with it or seek it out. If it's a card that comes up and I'm feeling very drawn to it, I might seek out the stone and seek out the plant, maybe grow the plant from having worked with it as an archetype or plan, a plant or crystal that personifies an archetype. So that's really interesting as well. So I hope that this was helpful for anybody interested in this deck. Uh, let me know what you think of this deck, and if you have it, let me know what you think of it as well. Until next time, bye everyone.